really warm welcome to our plenary session on the future of evidence synthesis. Um, first of all, thank you both to the Campbell Collaboration and the Global Development Network for organising this fabulous conference um, and this plenary session. I think you will all agree that this theme is an important one at this most difficult of times because evidence synthesis organisations have had to be agile and responsive all while dealing with many complex challenges like the enormous rate of published literature, some of those dodgy low quality preprints that have made the, play, or made the press are some of the ones that first come to my mind. Um, and then many evidence synthesis organizations and experts have been living under pressure during a time of great uncertainty. We've had to keep pace with the rapidly changing world we live in um, and leaders of these organizations have had to think outside the box, create opportunities for change and remain diligent with their decision making, all while understanding that need and pressure for timeliness. I'm not saying that this is unique to evidence synthesis, but that's the topic that I'm here to chair today. My name is Kira Keenan. I'm a research fellow um, in Queen's University, Belfast, and I've been lucky enough to be immersed in the methodology of evidence synthesis right from my master's in 2013, throughout my PhD research, and now throughout all my postdoctoral research so far. Um, I'm so glad to be part of the Campbell Collaboration family. I feel very supported by Campbell, and I always have done throughout my PhD right to now. Um, and because of this, I'm most motivated by capacity building and evidence synthesis and supporting fledgling analysts and reviewers um, to be and feel welcomed into this vibrant community of scholars um, and hopefully stay because they feel a part of something important. So just some housekeeping now, we have three wonderful speakers lined up for you. I will individually introduce each speaker who will present um, for 15 minutes um, and we've protected plenty of time at the end for a discussion. So I really encourage you to get involved with this discussion, become engaged with it, post your questions throughout um, in the chat and I'm going to keep a close eye on that as we listen to the presentations. So first of all, I'm delighted to introduce uh, James Thomas. James is a professor of social research and policy at the Epi Centre, which is part of UCL in London. His research is centred on improving policy and decision making through more creative use and appreciation of existing knowledge. It covers substantive uh, disciplinary fields, including public health and education, and also the development um, of tools and methods that support this work. And I'm particularly pleased with uh, every reviewer and every mapper. He has written extensively on research synthesis, including meta-analysis and methods for combining qualitative and quantitative research in mixed method designs. Um, and he's also designed uh, every reviewer software, which manages the data throughout all stages of the process of um, systematic review. So thanks very much and take it away, James. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll just share my screen. Let's see how easily this happens this time. How's that? Has that worked? Is I don't see it, it, but yeah, so yeah. it's possible Stop. that we don't. <laughs> I'll try it again. Maybe I clicked it too quickly. Window, PowerPoint, share. It thinks so, it. Yeah, we don't see it, but it, it worked during practice. There we go. I think well, it's a bit slow. Right. OK. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation as well to come and talk about this. Um, I don't probably need to say very much more about me after that intro. Um, I've worked at the Epicenter for a long time um, in systematic reviews, mostly for the Department of Health and Social Care, Public Health England, um, but many other disciplines as well. Um, and particularly what I've focused on is addressing questions beyond effectiveness um, and using different types of methods and research in evidence synthesis. 
and also making review, review processes more efficient. I'm going to touch on that now. So what I'm going to outline briefly, and I'm going to try and keep this nice and short so that we've got plenty of time for discussion, um, are the futures of evidence synthesis. Um, I'm going to start with where we are now, more or less, and where we're heading, and then pose some issues for us to talk about um, later in terms of how can we get where we want to get to. So I quite like this quote. Um, I don't know who said it in the first place. Um, the opinions are divided on it. But if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. So I think it's always useful just to check that actually where you're heading is actually where you're wanting to get to, because otherwise you might get there. So where are we heading? And I think um, experience in the pandemic has been a good example of where we are heading. Um, and we've seen some of the best and most um, impactful and methodologically robust evidence synthesis. And um, as um, <laughs> we know, we've also seen some of the worst. And for those of us who've been involved, uh, three things stand out, I think, um, though you know, others will stand out as well, I'm sure. But just the sheer effort required to keep up to date with current knowledge, that literally tens to hundreds of thousands of new papers on COVID-19 has been um, a challenge to keep up with. Um, obviously, the massive number of core quality and redundant studies that have been conducted, both in terms of just them not very good, but also redundant as in the research didn't need to take place because actually we already knew um, particular treatments just didn't work. So why why carry on um, investigating whether the answer is already in? The real lack of research in BSI, behavioral, environmental, social and systems interventions is a real um, stark message, I think. Um, clinically, we've done very, very well. Um, social interventions, much, much less well, in, just in terms of, of, of what we now know. Um, and I think one of the real issues we have with, with evidence is that fundamentally, primary research is not carried out in a way that is designed to contribute to existing knowledge. And I think evidence synthesis has a role to change this. So not all gloomy. Where are we now? The good. Um, over the last 10 years or more, systematic reviews are increasingly recognized now as the best way of understanding where we are, the state of current knowledge. Um, and that means that they're increasingly recognized as the best evidence to inform decisions. And I'm using systematic review evidence synthesis in a, an umbrella way here. Um, also, more and more people are engaged in this work globally. Um, and also in many, many dis disciplines now, which is which is all to be welcomed. And what we've found over the years is that new methods have evolved um, to address a wide range of research questions. Obviously, systematic reviews may have started on looking at effectiveness of treatments. They're no longer there. We're asking all sorts of different types of questions, including, importantly, maps and evidence gap maps, which tell us what we know, but also what's being investigated and what actually what should be needed to be investigated. Um, as I'm sure I was supposed to, I'll have got a slide on automation because actually now automation tools are making a real difference. This is an example of our workflow for COVID-19 evidence surveillance. We've got two um, or three maps now actually working off this workflow um, where essentially we have a large data set, in our case, the Microsoft Academic data set with all the research that we need um, actually already in it. It's 250 million records. The problem is with 250 million records finding the actual ones that you're actually interested in, um, we get new papers arriving every two weeks. And what we have are reviews in the database, in a reviewer here, and we have machine learning models which learn reviews and they learn every two weeks. So as reviews grow and change, um, the new knowledge is, is included in the model. As we get new papers, they're scored against these models, and then they're put into the appropriate reviews. And this this stuff is working. We're using it. Um, there's a paper on it here um, in terms of its cost effectiveness. And for our work, that's now beating um, our traditional, our conventional versed, our conventional sources of um, evidence in terms of databases that are usually searched, and also in terms of efficiency. So it's taking us less efforts to find the research that we are finding to put in. So that's that's important because it's, it's making a difference. But it's not easy. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of technical expertise in the center. Um, and you, you need to 
be constantly evaluating what you're doing when you're using these tools because they are so new. Um, they require considerable, if you're looking at something as big as um, a data set of 250 million records, you need lots of computational power and memory. You can't download all of that lot onto your local laptop and, and search it there. You actually need cloud computing. And again, obviously, then you need the resource and the expertise to, to, to cope with that. Um, but also, I think fundamentally, um, these automation systems are addressing problems in the infrastructure which we're working with, the way in which we curate knowledge, um, which are avoidable problems. And essentially, they're trying to fix past problems. And maybe what we should be doing is thinking about how we can avoid some of those problems in the first place. So where are we now in terms of the bad? Um, as, as we already know, um, systematic reviews are a time consuming process, but they're increasingly time consuming. And there's two reasons really. One is just the rate of research. There's so much, much research being um, conducted and published, um, which we're all familiar with. But I think also what's sort of slightly underrated is the methodological demand that's being placed on reviewers. Um, continually, what we're doing is refining and being critical and thinking about how we can do things better, which is great, and we should be doing that. But we very rarely reduce the amount of work involved in evidence synthesis as a result of methodological innovation. Most methodological innovation actually increases the work. I've seen very few, other than some of the automation tools, actually reduce. And that's something that's worth reflecting on when you're a methodologist like I am, in terms of actually what we might be doing is actually making it more difficult, more costly, and actually making evidence less likely to be used if we continually make um, increased methodological demands. So obviously, we've got the number, we've got lots of poor quality reviews that have come out on COVID-19, which have not only a poor quality in their own right, but they overlap with one another and they contradict one another. And that makes it difficult for decision makers to use them. And one of the problems that we've got is that actually we're not really progressing very quickly in terms of addressing some of these structural problems. And so these, these, you know, these problems are just perpetuating. So if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. So where are we heading? Um, obviously, there's, there's resource problems at the moment, and they're going to be increasingly the case, I think. Um, so we're going to be increasingly stretched. It's going to be increasingly difficult to come up with a growing evidence base. Um, and the danger here is that we, we have more and more papers saying systematic reviews, evidence synthesis, low quality. The perceived value in the products is going to go down, um, which you know, will we'll drive us in the opposite direction of where we want to get to. We're going to have less impact in terms of fixing some of the evidence curation problems that we're seeing. We'll have continued rest in research and we'll have a fragmented evidence ecosystem perpetuating. So we'll have data research published in multiple different databases, enclosed access um, databases, and we'll just carry on perpetuating the, the cycle that we're currently on. What I think we want to do is start to start looking at how we can might be able to fix some of those structural issues. And if we can, then what we should end up with is a place where it's increasingly easy to locate research that's relevant and efficiently. So we'll be able to get there. We'll be able to find the relevant research quick. Um, and we'll see that data, systematic review data, research data can be reused um, increasingly um, regularly. Um, and I think fundamentally what we want to get to is a place where primary research is designed from the word go to contribute to existing knowledge. We're not there at the moment. We've got these individual little research studies. I've got another note on that. Um, but also fundamentally, we don't want to be stuck in methodological silos. We do need that, that methodological diversity and that innovation that we've seen over the last number of years. So I think this is my last slide here. Um, some thoughts, and this is really for us to um, think about and pick apart. Um, I think that we need, as a sort of like an evidence synthesis community, to be more engaged in debates about the future of research. We've got this perspective We're over the whole of research in a particular area. We should use that in order to improve the field. If we lack research to synthesize, we need to shout about it. We need to say there's a knowledge gap here. So Bessie, the behavioral, et cetera, the social um, interventions, we should be telling funders that actually there's a clear knowledge gap here. Um, and we also need to be showing how we would benefit from better knowledge curation. So we need to think about how we can share back data better. So for example, you know what we're doing internally at Epicenter is that all our review data 
um, can be published as an open API and also downloadable so that you know, other people can reuse it when, when they want to. We've got to think about how we can share data, but also standards, how we can share data consistently um, across across organizations. And I think that involves engaging with funders and publishers to encourage them to get involved in this. Talking about data sharing, metadata publication, so we can actually locate research and reuse research much more efficiently. We also need to develop proper business models around open data and open everything. Um, there's lots of talk about open data, open access, open, oh, there's open synthesis, but what we lack is a business model actually to, to support those. The bills still need to be paid by different organizations. Um, I've mentioned the contribution different methodologies make. I think one of the things that we need to keep looking at, and probably particularly at the moment, is around causal inference. Um, there, there's some great work that's being done on this outside evidence synthesis, and we probably need to, to learn from that. Um, but fundamentally, we need to change the research culture. Eliakl had a nice phrase last week at um, the, the Cochrane Methods Symposium. Researchers shouldn't declare victory once their PDF has been published. What we should be thinking about is research not being done until it's actually contributed to pre-existing knowledge. So we actually know how it's contributed on top of what we already knew. And I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much, James. And um, thanks for those topic points at the end. I'm, I'm really <laughs> I'm really intrigued to see um, some, some of the discussion that will happen from the audience and um, based on, on your roadmap of where we want to go, perhaps we can start to set out some of those paving stones to stick with that attitude. Um, so while Vivian um, is getting her slides ready, I have the pleasure to introduce her. So Dr. Vivian Welch is Editor-in-Chief of the Campbell Collaboration. She's Director of the Methods Centre at the Breer Research Institute and Associate Professor at University of Ottawa School of Epidemiology and Public Health. Vivian's research interests include how to assess health equity in evidence synthesis and primary research studies. So take it away, Vivian. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vera. It was just enough time to get my slides set up, I think. Um, they're working okay. You can see them. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, thanks, James. That was a great uh, start to this session. And um, I think my slides are... Uh, our nice follow on to some of the challenges you've raised. Um, I'm going to talk about the future of evidence synthesis really from the Campbell Collaboration perspective as editor in chief of the Campbell Collaboration. Um, so let's see if I can advance my slides. Okay. Um, so, just a declaration of interest I hold various roles in Campbell and Cochrane. Um, and I have some funding from uh, CNE Institutes of Health Research, um, World Health Organization, and IHR. Okay, so I think this is the problem that James already started us off with, that um, this mass production of systematic reviews, this is a pretty old slide from 2016, but as James said, the same, you know, um, problem happened during COVID that we had a number of reviews often on the same topic and not coming up with the same conclusion. Um, and that can undermine, I think, the trust in uh, systematic reviews and evidence synthesis, as you said, James. Um, so um, I'm going to um, give you about 10 minutes on my thoughts about um, some of the priorities for the Campbell collaboration and meeting some of these ch challenges. Um, I see the four areas that we're working on quite actively. Uh, timeliness, James, that you mentioned, um, replicability and avoiding waste. So how do reviews you know, contribute to the evidence base, add value to the evidence base and um, avoid redundancy? Uh, equity and engagement, how do we engage with stakeholders? But I think, James, you raise a really great challenge about how to do that without increasing the burden on systematic reviews teams. And um, the last one, diversity of methods approaches. And um, it's early in the morning here at six. So I'm going to uh, highlight this talk with some examples from my garden. So that photo is my garden in May before I plant it out to my husband's horror. Um, and uh, so first when thinking about timeliness, um, first thing out of my garden are radishes. So <laughs> those are my radishes in probably the end of May, they come out really soon. Um, 
So James already, um, you know, uh, you highlight how long it takes to do systematic reviews. And these are some quite old numbers about um, the time to do a published publish Cochrane review after the protocols, um, almost two years. And that's similar for Campbell reviews. Um, and uh, many reviews don't get published and updating also takes a long time. Um, so I'm just going to highlight two things I think that Campbell is doing related to um, uh, timeliness. Um, the first is evidence and gap maps that James, you already mentioned, and um, the Epi Center has uh, developed a really easy way to map the evidence. Um, one thing that these maps do is make this, the studies more discoverable, um, and that can accelerate doing systematic reviews on these topics. So this is an example of a, a map on um, effectiveness of interventions for people who are homeless. And um, this map was actually used to commission three uh, systematic reviews um, to build the evidence base. And one of those reviews was done in less than a year, thanks to being able to identify the studies in the map. Um, okay, the second thing, I, James has mentioned already technology, and I'm, we're, um, very supportive of technology, but I didn't have the, the tools as every reviewer does, so we certainly encourage the use of technology. But the other thing we can do, I think we need to attack the problem of timeliness from many directions. So the other thing that we do is ask authors to fill in methodologic expectations checklist, um, what we call messier. And this is uh, a burden. It does take time to do them, but it can speed up the editorial process by getting a higher quality submission. Um, and the second thing is the information management systems that our journals use. The camp collaboration is in the middle of uh, changing to um, uh, a, a journal information management system, which can help with communication across the parts of the editorial process. And uh, the only garden picture I could think of was this. Um, this is my cherry tree. When I saw all these cherries, I thought this was far too much work. So I engaged the team to get the cherries. <laughs> but, you know, we also do this in systematic reviews. A number of our maps are crowdsourced. So we have the crowd helping us get um, the studies, identified studies. Um, okay, replicability and avoiding waste. Um, the only garden picture I could think of this is my tomatoes. These are the most wasteful plants I could think of. You have to cut this jungle of leaves so that they don't keep wasting their energy and producing leaves and not tomatoes. Um, but in systematic reviews, we have too many reviews. Um, there uh, are some things that Campbell Collaboration can do and other evidence synthesis organizations can do. Um, the first is that we insist all of our reviews uh, show why their review is needed in light of existing reviews and other evidence. Um, so they provide that justification. And the second is that uh, Campbell uh, is supportive of um, replication, thoughtful replication of systematic reviews. So when they're high priority, there's um, uncertainty, uh, a high population impact potential. Um, then we encourage replication of the existing reviews um, to put uh, to answer those questions. Okay. The other thing James mentioned is open synthesis, and we have a lot of work to do in this space. Um, Campbell is collaborating with Neil Hadaway and uh, Kira Keenan and Tamara Lotfi. Um, Ellie Ackle, James is involved as well on what is open synthesis and how can we support it. Um, and make it easy to do. Um, and making it uh, easy to do, I think, James, you've already mentioned, we need to um, identify the, the ways to uh, the business model of open synthesis. Um, but in the meantime, Campbell is, um, has moved to expecting data sharing. So we encourage all, we ask all our authors to provide a statement about how um, people can access their data. Um, and that includes all of the components of a systematic review that James mentioned. So um, the search strategy, the, the coding data, the analysis. Okay, equity engagement. Again, I have challenges getting a good garden photo, but this is actually my neighbor's garden in our garden. So we uh, have a lot of uh, sun and uh, we decided to share our sun with our neighbors. So we gave them a 10 by 12 foot plot of land um, 
and they taught us subsequently how to grow lettuce and beets and carrots. Um, this is actually lettuce and beets, but the beets are so small you can't tell. Um, so there's, you know, great power in sharing, engaging with other people. Um, this is a slide about um, what is engagement. Um, there are different levels of engagement that Sally Crow um, uh, adapted. Um, and it can be as minimal as receiving information or um, uh, really up to co-production where stakeholders are engaged in asking the questions, answering the questions, interpreting the evidence. Um, so in Campbell, we encourage stakeholder engagement the main way is in our coordinating groups, um, where we um, require all of our coordinating groups to have an external advisory board. That advisory board brings policy and practice experience to the um, editorial teams, um, and it brings global experience. So um, the best example of uh, a coordinating group advisory board is our crime and justice steering uh, group, which is about consists of about 20 experts in policing, justice, and law. Um, and they are involved in assessing the titles, the protocols, the reviews, and they're also involved in disseminating them. So I think I love that quote, James, about Ellie Ackle, that you can't declare victory once your PDF is published. But I think the crime and justice group in Campbell has really um, uh, exemplified that because they really um, push their their reviews out to policy and practitioners who need them. Um, okay, so, and then um, last thing, diversity of methods approaches. I actually have many things in my garden, but this is just one photo of two things, tomatoes and broccoli that need very different um, help. Actually, I'm not quite sure what broccoli needs because it really didn't succeed. <laughs> that was the most broccoli I got. Um, but you need uh, methods that are fit for purpose. Um, so uh, we have a quite strong Campbell Methods Coordinating Group, which is um, now inviting uh, paper submissions on guidance and methodological research. Um, and uh, these are some of the methods that are being um, uh, explored in terms of existing guidance. And the other thing Campbell does is collaborate with other evidence synthesis organizations. Um, so we don't reinvent guidance when there's already good guidance. Um, and um, uh, you can find out more about this in their editorial. So um, I hope I convinced you that Campbell's trying to think about how to change direction, James. Um, but um, this is uh, just a summary of our library. So we continue to grow year on year. Um, the last year is year to date, so it does look a bit smaller. Um, but we are continuing to grow and um, we really invite more people to join us. As Kira already mentioned, I think um, we're a vibrant community that uh, is really open to new uh, scholars. Um, these are, I hope so small that you can't actually see the faces, uh, all of the editorial teams within Campbell uh, and we'd love to have more. So um, with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian, and I love that you get so much inspiration from your garden, and uh, it's also a very healthy pastime to have, so that's excellent. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm delighted now to introduce the final speaker um, today, um, who is Karen Haynes, who is professor, Associate Professor at KU Leuven. She chairs the European Network for Qualitative Inquiry and is a member of the Campbell Qualitative Evidence Synthesis Group. Karen has a background in social welfare, behavioural science and public health. Karen coordinates a research group on social, methodological and theoretical innovation. She specialises in creative research methods, including art-based, multi-sensory, place-based and futuring research designs. Her group works from an inclusive academic activist perspective and engages in creative research dissemination. Karen currently applies her methods base in the broad field of urban and sustainable development, the art and design sector and community based research practice. Her approach to synthesize evidence is multimodal. I'm really excited about this, Karen. Karen, you're on mute. Karen, your microphone's muted. Yep. 
can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah. So can you see the slides all right? Okay. Yes, Karen, thanks. Yeah, great. Okay, so the innovative bit I want to plead for today is uh, perhaps to extend the types of evidence that we usually consider for a systematic review. So are this evidence and where primary scientific studies try to provide us with an understanding of a universal experience, usually art provides us with a universal understanding of very personal experiences. But art and science both come into existence through a systematic exploration of complex phenomena. So when Ian Chalmers inaugurated the Cochrane collaboration in 1993, it soon crossed over to Campbell to the humanities and social behavioral sciences. But what people usually don't know is that at the same time, on the other side of the ocean, Elliot Eisner uh, pleaded or launched the idea of art-based research at an educational event in Stanford Un University. And he pleaded for a stronger connection between artistic practice and conventional types of research that we usually consider in an attempt to convince us of the relevance of art to advance knowledge and build uh, knowledge. Uh, yet in practice, these uh, movements have actually seldom met. And I think one of the main reasons is that we, as a review community, we tend to focus on written research reports as our main source of information. And perhaps artistically inspired research evidence doesn't serve the, the printed page too well, uh, because creative evidence often is tangible. It might have a 3D physical appearance, or it might be very fluid and dynamic. So our challenge as a review community is also to learn, appreciate, embrace this full range of research-driven expression modes in communicating research findings. In essence, artistically inspired evidence embraces that full range of visual, literally sonic, tactile, multimodal dimensions of expression. Uh, it considers the full tangible nature of artistic evidence, but this really challenges the way we currently collect, analyze, assess, and even synthesize research data, particularly because of the tangible uh, dimension of it. But in essence, the word evidence comes from e videre. So e is out there, videre, to see. So we evidence is what we can see out there. Does it always has had this tangible dimension? It has a weight, it has a height, and we can measure that, which is what we call factual evidence. But it always comes into existence purposefully through a series of events or actions. And sometimes we call these actions methods, but I tend to call them conventions. Um, as you notice on the right side, there's a lot of stuff there uh, that actually gets meaning when you bring it into context. Evidence to me is in essence always a bit sensorial and it is similar to the notion of empirical in uh, scientific research. Most important evidence matters to me, so matter actually is also evidence. This is how I got intrigued by the element of matter as evidence and think power, uh, which became one of my guiding concepts to answer the question how to best integrate art or tangible stuff into reviews. Uh, and this could mean different things. It could mean including artistically inspired evidence in systematic reviews, or it could also mean using creative art forms as a method to express review findings, so delivering a systematic review as an art product. And it is this tangible nature of art that invites us to believe that there are some physical bodies of evidence out there, so things and stuff inside our bodies or outside our bodies we have to relate to. But how does one grasp the scientific essence of such a material dimension? And this is what I would like to illustrate via two pilot review cases we're currently working on in the area of infectious diseases. And in the first pilot, we actually questioned how matter comes to matter in studying adherence to antiretroviral therapy. 
of young people permanently infected with HIV. And we took a fairly standard approach to reviewing evidence from primary papers. So we did a comprehensive search, applied in an exclusion criteria, praised the evidence, and um, engaged in a thematically inspired um, analysis for which we used the biopsy for social model as a framework and we added that material uh, dimension to it and while we were reviewing we came to the conclusion that any attempt to capture tangible and material dimensions of experience in word and numbers felt a bit arbitrary which is why we chose a different pathway and the reason why becomes a bit arbitrary is because we initially always assume that people can simply speak about things and places and that we can capture that or grasp the essence of it through words, that things or an environment is some sort of a passive element uh, we can act upon as humans. That a pill is something that one takes, not something that in itself has the power to influence our behavior. And that is perhaps simply not true, because even a pill has a, a vitality of its own. We act upon it and it acts upon us. Which is why one of my PhD students actually engaged in storyboarding as a way of anal an analyzing and representing a material review findings. And I'd like to share a little bit of that piece with you. In this illustration, we are going to show you how we use an odds-based approach to make sense of review findings, and we will narrate the findings in a storyboard way. So, in this review, we explore the adherence to antiretroviral therapy for young people who infected with HIV in low to middle income. kid first find out about the HIV status or the taking medicine, they might have lots of questions for parents and this is where we start our story. Well, why am I taking all of these medicines? I'm not sure what it's for. Am I sick? And the mommy is so confused, she's not sure. Should I tell her? Should I tell him? Should I wait until he's older? In some instances, Parents don't have the opportunity to tell kids, and kids might suffer from loss of parents. Now, when parents pass away, they start thinking about, you know, why did my parents die? Why am I still going to the clinic? And they might be going with guardians to the clinic, unsure about what they're doing. I go to the clinic all the time. Why is that so? There are so many people at the clinic. I see them standing outside. They're judging me. Why am I at this door that says HIV? I've been to the office and I see the nurse and she's holding this huge chart. And on this chart, she's telling me that I need to take a test. What is this test for, mommy? Can you please explain? Can somebody please explain to me what's going on? The nurse says, I'm sorry, my dear. I think you have HIV. What? What does that mean? Am I going to die? Am I going to die like my mom or my dad? What about my friends? They are going to make fun of me. People are going to laugh at me. Can I still go to school? Can I still play with everyone? What am I going to do? I know people come to the clinic when they're sick. I know people who are very sick with HIV and they don't have lots of friends. And as the kid gets older and starts becoming more familiar with treatment, they start being more hopeful as the treatment starts to work. Um, support and motivation from family members and friends really benefits them. And if there is a family member who is HIV positive and ideas, it's really a positive role model. And they say, I don't want to give up on my dreams. I have the support of my family. I want to move towards a better life. There is Things I want to do, there's a career that I want to follow. But with all of that going on, I'm so quiet. Shh. I can't talk to anyone. I'm trapped in this box of being an HIV positive person. I have marks on my face. How am I going to deal with the side effects of the tablets? 
in my environment, I have to deal with walking to the clinic. It's far, it's dangerous. There are religious institutions. I can go to my church, be so lusty. I feel like I'm invisible. At the same time, I feel like I am visible to everybody because of my status. It costs money to go to the clinic. I don't have money. People are going to find out my secret. My poll box is so big. Where do I hide it? I could hide it in my friend's pocket. Sometimes I can't take my pills because I don't have food. I don't have enough money. I have to think about the clinic, food, tablets, missing work. My relationships are so affected by my status. I don't know if I should tell my partner. What if my partner doesn't want to use a condom? What if I have to prove that I love him or her? I remember when I was in, in the boarding school, I used to hide my tablets on the side table next to my bed, sometimes in my friend's pocket, where no one could find it and I could take it undercover. Sometimes I'd go to the toilet and I'd take it there where no one would see me. Life is full of decisions, fear, stigma, in all kinds of spaces and time, whether it's on the road to the clinic, public transport, at church, in my family, at school. There's so many issues to deal with and I negotiate secrets all the time, weighing the cost of health over social and economic constraints. This is a whole embodied experience, a multi-sensorial experience, both within me and outside of me. Adherence to my medication is not as easy as it seems. So this is a good example of where art is used as a way of representing findings from a systematic review. The second pilot I want to show you is more about including art in a review. Um, and the reason why we did that was because of COVID-19, because we have long assumed that we could tackle any crisis with insights from scientific evidence. And while Corona was not a typical example of a black swan, it did caught us by surprise. And it was actually in the absence of a clear reference frame or evidence that people started to create evidence in many different ways. And it is in this disruptive moment that artistically inspired evidence pops up more prominently. It sort of explains what cannot be spoken about or for which there are no words yet. And in such cases, we start thinking with our pens, our hands, our body, our ears, all of our senses to make art. And it happened um, actually across the world. So in the second rather unconventional type of review project, we questioned how we could best sustain life on Earth under COVID-19 uh, condition, conditions. And we gathered artistic responses from artists, researchers to the COVID-19 crisis instead of searching for qualitative studies that would help us explain how people experienced it because these studies were largely absent. And several scholars actually produced tangible evidence during their lockdown periods. Uh, and in thinking about what the most convenient way was to represent that primary evidence, we created an online gallery in which we brought together uh, their work and interpreted it, again, from a thematic analytical uh, perspective. So what I'd like to show you is a little bit of that gallery. Um, oh, my apologies. There we go where we stored uh, the primary uh, research evidence. So this is a small part of our primary research evidence exhibition. And there's one spot where you can enter our gallery and the pair of green feet you see are mine. And I'm walking through this gallery as we speak. So you can look at the works uh, from a distance, or you can also take a closer look to observe some of the details of this artistic evidence and really emerge with it. Um, the works are always clustered around certain themes uh, and you can see them appear on the wall there like emotional impact was a big 
team that came out of the primary artistic evidence, uh, talking about safety, acceptance, and so on. And so when you walk a little bit further, you can see uh, perhaps bigger chunks of text, which are fragments of interpretation and theoretical framing uh, from the researchers. So the themes are mainly content-based, but sometimes also tap into specific qualities of the works themselves, like color, form, contrast, and what sort of tacit knowledge this uh, reveals about the experience of COVID-19. Okay. And then on the level of synthesis, we were trying to think of a way to bring all these primary artistic accounts together. And we worked with in an audiovisual production in which we merged both the visual artwork as the sounds and also collided it with some of the narratives that were shared by uh, the makers about their experiences. So I just wanted to give you a sense of how an artistically inspired synthesis might look like. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Marathon Symposium. Here comes every breath you breathe. Do you know you have to sing happy birthday twice after you At the beginning of lockdown, I experienced a sense that we're on the parent of the There was no ear. I felt chased. I could not get away from myself. I couldn't get away from myself. I couldn't. Here comes every breath you breathe. I couldn't get away from myself. I couldn't get away from myself. Absurd. Adventurous. Central typical. I know it will change over time. One star is okay, but a sky full of them is cosmically. I couldn't get away. I couldn't get away from myself. I couldn't get away from myself. I could not get away from myself. And there was no way to track it, and I was sure what one knows. Not afraid. Inextricably. I am constantly running against time, but I hardly move forward. It is as if time flows. It has no beginning nor an end. It flows in different directions. There's a game we play as children at parties. As the music plays, you express yourself physically through dancing, moving about. The grown ups remove a chair each time the music plays. When the music stops, you find the nearest chair and sit on it firmly. But this feels so different. I don't have COVID, I just got tested. What do I hope as we emerge from this? That we are changed. That we build our global connections and see ourselves as interconnected. We are not separate. That we prioritize justice in the environment and learn to live in balance and respect of overall for nature and all people. We really do have a marathon. I did not know myself, and my sons felt pointless. When the music stops, you find the nearest chair and sit on it. Only. You are the first that I began to love my work. I felt like a cool man. Okay, so this is work in progress, uh, where we try to recreate that sense of disruption through uh, this artistic synthesis, which is an example of how you can include art into a synthesis, but also use it as a way to represent findings again. Um, to conclude, I might want to return back to 1993, which for me was some sort of a tipping point, a momentum that was created for both communities to meet up. And I'm bringing that storyline back to us. Um, 
because I think the requirements to really open up to this different community might be to unlock ourselves from the types of evidence, perhaps also some of the epistemological frameworks we assume we are tied to, whilst at the same time trying to remain sensitive to the argument of quality of uh, the reviews uh, we produce. And in order to build these bridges, we are already taking our own responsibility in that, in trying to inventorize specialized journals, platforms where artistic evidence can be found, but also by using arts-based methods perhaps to prioritize and gather review questions. We are also working on evaluation criteria to assess the quality of artistically inspired evidence and developed and tested an apparatus for the analysis of visual research material by which we can combine with uh, narratives. Um, and we are, of course, building a review community in itself where the idea of multimodality or different types of evidence and how this can be merged is a central uh, or core element. But that's uh, a different story to tell, but one I'm happily inviting you into because, in fact, we can use all the hands, ears, pens and bodies um, we can get. And I thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, Karen, and, and thank you especially for sharing those examples, which, you know, I find to be very impactful and, um, you know, uh, just a really important way um, to, to help deepen our understanding um, of review findings. Um, and it reminds me of something recently. So I'm, I'm currently working on a review of video-based interventions for children with autism. And uh, Temple Grandin um, famously said that, you know, we think in pictures. Um, and you've inspired me to, to engage with those key stakeholders, so the children that will be using the map and, and ask that question, how, how should these findings be presented in, in the way that makes most sense and helps you understand? Um, so I guess I have a question around that, Karen, is, is how should we engage um, with, with stakeholders and advisory groups to, to um, ensure that the art we include in our reviews um, yeah. It makes that purpose to, to deepen understanding. Yeah, I agree that collaboration is the key there, Chiara, because uh, this whole project wouldn't have come to life if it weren't for a bunch of artists this, this thinking us through what good representation formats could be. But there's a, a couple of groups. There's the, the Arts-Based Research Global Consortium, that has both um, people from humanities and social behavioral sciences in there and artists. There's also a couple of networks such as the International Network Qualitative Inquiry and the European Sister Event that has quite strong groups that work around cr creative evidence or artistic evidence. And in an initial phase, you sort of learn from them and then you try to figure out which one of these ideas would actually apply to your own discipline or would make it feasible for you to work as such. Um, so collaboration is indeed key um, there. But one of the powerful elements of using art is that um, people notice it much sooner and they sort of get empathically engaged with it. And perhaps we know from neurological research, if you're in behavioral sciences, that, you know, the brain picks up visual stimulus, but also smell stimulus and sound stimulus much better than it does written reports. And so that's one of the other arguments. If you want to disseminate knowledge broadly or more broadly, this is the way that people will remember uh, better what you have brought um, to them. Thank you. And I thought it was interesting that um, the visual thing did flow throughout the presentation. So Vivian, you used pictures from your garden to represent um, issues with the, the future of evidence synthesis. And, and, and James, I know, um, 
it's that visual uh, representation of research that Epi Mapper use that that you know someone who's interested in a topic area or research area can can see with with their eyes at a glance what exists and what doesn't. Um, I don't know if either of you want to say anything um, about that um, because we do have some questions coming through. Um, so I'll maybe go to the audience then. Um, so. Agnes, and this is for you, Karen, um, um, and says artistically inspired evidence could be useful when seeking evidence from those in vulnerable situations, including children. Um, is there any training program for persons interested in learning more about this approach to evidence presentation? <laughs> um, we do regular courses uh, from the, the, the Global Arts Based Network for young scholars, PhD scholars, but evidently this also links to a, a broader uh, community about how to visualize data. So it's not exclusively to the arts sector. I think there's a number of courses into visualizing data that are also very relevant, perhaps for the statistical community that sits uh, into this session. Um, and yeah, I, I can't pinpoint which university would be better uh, for that or which program, but many universities now engage with uh, creatively disseminating research findings. So perhaps creative research dissemination or communication is, is one of the key terms that would lead you to training programs. And I wanted to comment on something else. Uh, you raised uh, in the public, which is working art into um, vulnerable communities. And I think that's one of the values it has because it does not re require a common language per se. So it works particularly well, the method of using arts with um, refugee communities, people with whom we don't share the same language or people who have, you know, got into some sort of trauma which makes it difficult for them to speak about that trauma then sometimes art is a way of gathering these data in in a different dimension so that they don't have to bring up their experience in words which is often very very difficult for them so it acknowledges a bit of the tacit knowledge base that is in there Thank you so much um, for, for the answer and thank you very much for the question. There's lots of uh, brilliant discussion going on um, in the comments and keep posting. Um, James, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll come to you next because um, there's, there's, a, there's a few questions in the chat, I think, that are related to the burden of evidence synthesis and you touched on that um, during your talk about the methodological expectations um, can sometimes um, be too onerous a task for what we're actually trying to achieve um, and I wonder if you can maybe speak to that a bit more um, and perhaps talking about the advancements of technology. Yeah sure um, Karen's got me thinking at the moment so if, if I'm allowed I'd like to come back to what th those thoughts are but yeah in terms of the burden of um, work that methods are sort of putting on people. I think it's it's some it's something which, you know, if someone writing a history of the development of methods and evidence synthesis would note that you know there are more and more, you know, increasingly what you see are papers which say, oh look, there's this problem in evidence synthesis and this is the solution to it. And you know, if you're thinking about searching or if you're thinking about risk of bias assessment, et cetera, et cetera. And each time you can't often argue with the empirical basis on which that methodological development has, is, is based because it's based on sound research often. But the implication of what happens is it makes re reviews more difficult to do, require more expertise, require long, more time, more resources, et cetera, et cetera. And so I remember years ago, it was probably at the, um, it might have been at Cochrane's 20th, birthday party or maybe earlier than that I remember Ian Chalmers sort of commenting on this and that was a long time ago saying you know this methodological development's all very well but we've got to make these things easy to do otherwise you know we're, we're going to get to a place where they come you know they become impossible to do and I don't think we've really 
learned that lesson yet. We need to think, you know, both about we need to get them right, but we also need to get them possible. And I think that's where my work on um, automation really fits in. You know, in terms of how my thinking about it is that there are things that you can get um, machines to do, which you know humans don't really like doing anyway. Though you know, actually, I find I find screening weirdly useful in terms of understanding where my where my review fits into this like the, the wider landscape of reviewings. But you know, you know, we don't have time to do the amount of screening that we do, and machines can be taught to do it. So we should be using automation in a way which. Um, enables us to engage more fully with the complexity of the evidence base that's what how the ways and, and you know the, the the evidence base is complex and so we have to un, you know we have to appreciate that um and you know it takes time to get your head around something complex so sometimes i think you know that we just if we if we have better surveillance that we're better on top of the evidence to start with then it's not such a big effort then to say well okay so he, you know here's where we are at the moment whereas at the moment because we don't have anything in place to sort of keep a good surveillance on current knowledge and because we don't design research and conduct research and then report research in a way which contributes to current knowledge we're forever not really knowing what we know and that's that's really the cycle that and, you know, we we haven't actually found a solution to, and that's you know that's kind of where where my talk was 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 you know located. Um, yeah, I'll stop. Thank you. I um I will come back to you on your thoughts of car because it it's definitely got my brain whirling as well. But just on that, I think um, maybe in, it would be interesting to hear from you. You know, in your editorial roles as editor in chief of Campbell, um, how you're working at that balance. So. Um, not letting perfect be the enemy of the good, um, you know, trying to remain agile and responsive, but also being keenly aware that you want a reader to pick up a Campbell review and, and have the expectation for really high and robust rigor and methodological quality to always be there. Yeah, thanks. I don't think I have much more to add than what James has said, that I think we're not there yet about how to um, focus the review. Um, certainly in Campbell, um, we ask uh, review authors to say what they're not going to do. So, and I think that's starting to go down the road of making reviews simpler and more focused. So um, a number of our reviews do not engage with qualitative evidence um, and they just basically say that this review won't answer this question. And I, I think I saw James in the chat was saying that um, I think we need to think about when a review can take a focus question, um, even in a complex space, and answer that question, even if they're not answering, you know, all the questions. Um, and that's one way to make the reviews more possible, is, is to focus. Um, I don't think I have much more <laughs> to help with that. I think, I think that, that's great, um, Vivian, thanks so much. Um, so James, you, you mentioned you, want, you wanted to just come back on um, one of one of your thoughts raised from Karen's discussion or talk. Yeah, no, it was really, really sort of thought provoking. I think you know what what the, one of the things that we've struggled with in the you know this pandemic period has been this challenge of research, sort of wanting to be objective and empirical, and you know saying, well, okay, so here's what the evidence says. You know, thinking about I don't know vaccinations at the moment. So you know, here here's the evidence on vaccinations, um, and it's very rational and it appeals to people's rationality. Um, and then we've got uh, people who are sort of appealing to people's fears and saying, you know, um, these things are dangerous. There's all the you know, they'll, they'll implant a chip in you that will be all connected to the 5G networks and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there, obviously there are people outside our schools going into the schools now campaigning against these vaccinations because actually the evidence, such as it is on, you know, anti-vax is more compelling than the evidence coming from science. And I think, you know, one of the things that Karen's talk said to me was you know, very clearly that actually, you know, we're not rational beings. A lot of people, you know, we make decisions based a lot of time on emotion. And, you know, maybe what we should be doing is, okay, we, you know, we know what the rational evidence is saying here, but actually if we convey it in such a boring 
way which doesn't actually engage people uh, you know properly then you know then we just leave a gap for pseudoscience to which can be can can fill so you know, it'd be really interesting to think about okay so we've got our robust evidence but actually there's a huge you know multitude of different ways in which we might want to communicate that and actually um if we don't work on that communication then something else will fill that void yeah definitely uh james and you know what i always think about is you know if if, if two methods or two evidence tracks actually do the same, then they would make each other redundant, right? It's, it's particularly because they do something different that there's a reason for them uh, to exist and a reason for them to embrace. Um, also in relation to, you know, your vaccination campaign, which is, which is a worldwide struggle. Um, I, I think the idea of participatory communication of science would be that way in between where you actually engage the public um, into writing the message uh, together with the scientists, which is something we are now experimenting with, um, with broader communities, uh, also in response to some of the questions there. You don't always have to speak the same language to be able to produce something uh, relevant or something uh, provocative that opens up debate, uh, which is what art is supposed to do, while science often has the tendency to, to, to close down or finalize a debate, you know, and then it is reopened the moment there's conflicting evidence. I think that is a different movement that actually uh, creates a lot more uh, possibilities within a review community to deal with that ambivalence, because that's what art is good at, you know, it takes this ambivalence and it does something literally with that um, to get people engaged. Yeah. But I do think that science is being done wrong if what it's trying to do is to close down debate. And, you know, in most of the reviews that, that all of us have been involved in, you know, the la we don't end up with a neat diamond at the bottom of a forest plot. You know, the, what's always the, you know, the focus of, of people's interest is around what is driving differences in whatever we're seeing, whether it's people's perspectives, their experiences, or, or the effects of interventions. It's very rarely that we're trying to close it down and say, you know, that's the effect that you'll get if you do this. So yeah, I, I agree, and I think, but I do think that um, you know there's too much trying to close down the debate. They're much more alike than that they're different in that sense, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have a comment, I think, um, on this same point of discussion about how evidence is communicated, boring versus compelling. Um, and Vivian, am I correct that you perhaps have done some work um, on this in? how best to disseminate review findings um, where, you, where you looked at this question of what, how people want to read um, systematic reviews? Um, actually, not myself, no. We did a, a systematic review on uh, the effectiveness of policy briefs, actually, for communicating with policymakers. Um, and then we did some interviews with policymakers about what they want to see. And um, they want to see pictures. They want to have one sentence that tells you the findings, and they want to see, you know, short bullet points. I, I totally agree about the compellingness of evidence. You know, I think this is a great space for priorities for evidence synthesis itself. Um, Campbell has a recent review on counter narratives, so actually using stories um, to uh, change people's views. Um, and I think this is one place that evidence synthesis is going. And uh, maybe James, you touched on this about the lack of evidence on um, behavior and social science interventions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a direct question here, which I think could be useful because we have a methodologist on, on the line. So James, um, it was, the, the comment around synthesizing uh, evidence um, not published or available in English. Um, and apparently it came up before in the conference, so perhaps we should touch on it. Yeah, and there's no easy answer. 
so sorry if you thought I had one. I don't think there is. I think well, I mean, one of the things relating to my talk that we've noticed using the Microsoft academic data set, just non-conventional data sets, is that we've got far more non-English language research coming through because that data set's based on a web crawl rather than specific you know, often English language um, journals and databases. So I think there's something about where we look and it's quite important that we start to sort of look beyond a push model of um, publishers putting stuff into repositories and then, you know, something which is much broader and actually looking to see what we can find on the web. Um, there's also a whole load of tools which um, help us um, auto-translate stuff, which are actually not bad now. They're good enough to um, for you to get a sense of what our paper's about, so they're not perfect. But I mean, there's no review team on earth that can that has got representation from every single possible language and dialect. So you know, we do need you know that's one way area where we can possibly use the automation. And the other is that on the development of use of automation, I have to be really careful and critical to understand exactly how some of these systems are working. A lot of them are based on big English language models. Um, and you know, they're inherently biased, both in terms of actually what's what the way in which the language has been constructed within them, but also in terms of which languages are included. And so, you know, some of the simpler models um, work better um, in that they're language agnostic. They don't they don't depend on vocabularies and 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 pre-training on on sort of English language um, papers. So, I, I think you know I think that's part of what we need to do. Um, as, as a sort of evidence synthesis community is is to feed into computer science um, the way in which we need to use these types of tools and that we don't want something which will only work in English and this has sort of got a heavy North American bias about the way in which language is represented. That we, and But unless we engage with that, so that's kind of what we're being fed at the moment. Thank you, James. And, and one of the things you mentioned there um, around bias in the data set already, um, um, I think leads on to, to another point of discussion that I wanted to have, and it's around um, the importance of equity around uh, in evidence synthesis um, and ev equity informed reviews. Um, and, and Vivian, that's that's you're, you're the expert but in equity on, on this panel. Um, and it was that question around, you know, how better to understand um, equity that's been involved in, in primary research so that we can represent that fully in evidence synthesis? Yeah, I think we have one minute left, but I, I totally agree that we need to think more about um, equity when we're uh, starting systematic reviews and um, planning reviews and uh, we have a chapter in the, the Cochrane Handbook on equity in specific populations but I think um, you know there's more work to be done on that but Campbell is uh, starting to plan a, a policy about coding for equity in our reviews that um, um, we hope will help to highlight that issue. Thank you so much and thank you also for the timekeeping. <laughs> I wasn't sure it was another another five minutes or another 20 so that's that's excellent. I could have been talking to myself here. Um, so I think based on that if if I could put everybody on the spot on the panel and ask for 20 to 30 seconds of the future of evidence synthesis from your perspective and a bottom line on where you want to see it go uh, using, using James's journey idea. So um, I'll start with you, Karen, if that's okay. From my perspective, the, the core point or the core innovation sits in embracing multimodality, which also speaks towards the agenda of Vivian, because through acknowledging different types of talents, you sort of get a more comprehensive picture in terms of what we write, the numbers we create, the visuals we create, the sort of evidence we are um, about to include in the future. So multimodality is key. Thank you, and thank you for your timeliness. Um, Vivian, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, still struck by uh, James's uh, quote, if we're not careful, we'll end up where we're headed um, with the lovely feet running. So um, 
I just uh, really thank everyone for a thought provoking session. I think uh, evidence synthesis has some work to do to think about how we um, make it easier to do the right thing. Thank you. And James, will end with your talk. Oh dear. Um, I, th I think that there are lots of methods pieces that knock research. They say this is wasteful. They say this is duplicated. They say this is bad. What you know, we, that's kind of been done. What actually we could do with is more engagement around how we fix the is structural issues around um, the use of and the discovery of evidence. So you know, less less. We're doing it all wrong. We know that, but actually, you know, how how can we move forward from where we are now to you know a you know a more efficient and equitable way of discovering and using evidence? Perfect. Thank you so much um, to all the panelists. Um, that was an excellent, thought-provoking conversation that I hope we can have um, throughout the rest of the conference. Um, thank you very much to you, the audience, and thank you for posting questions, and thank you for, for being part of this. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you to Campbell and the Global Development Network, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of you after, after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.